you know, I, I can't help but think of, you know, for example, our current national security threats that uh, are outlined in national policy. And I, again, I won't get into it, but our service members right now in the Space Force who are thinking about things we're probably going to get into, like near-Earth objects and so, so forth, you know, read in policy memoranda that uh, the biggest threats that we face in this country are global climate change and uh, white supremacy and COVID-19. I mean, literally, that's the those are the, the big three. And uh, that doesn't really resonate with our service members. And, uh, you know, setting the politics aside, uh, I think what it's what you're getting into is a, extremely important because uh, while it's not directly political in nature, all of these things have been politicized. And uh, it's unfortunate because just a little bit of understanding geology and some of the uh, Holocene history that you're talking about here can really help put some current political arguments into perspective, I think. Absolutely. And here's the thing to understand is that that I was going with this is that come around uh, between the 13th and 14th century AD, after a period of global warmth called the medieval warm period, the planet shifted gears uh, and it we went into a multi-phased little ice age, as it's been called. Um, the planet began to cool in the late 1200s. It accelerated in the 1300s. There was, um, there was a, a, a major cooling event, several cooling events that happened back to back between about 1310 and 1340, which led to a succession of agricultural failures, which led to famine. The famine led to, uh, compromised immune systems, which led to the onset of the bubonic plague. And this wiped out, you know, a third of the population of Europe. It was a horrible thing that happened. And it was a consequence of global cooling. Was it more serious than COVID? <laughs> well, Just let's kidding. put it this way. Let's put it this way. There were so many corpses lying around that the living couldn't, there were not enough living people to bury You're the corpses. Horrific, horrific yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, it was horrific. That was truly a pandemic, right? Yeah. So here's my point is that I'm getting at is that during this little ice age, globally, glaciers grew to their largest extent that they have been in 10,000 years of the Holocene. Okay, we got to put that into perspective, which is not usually, um, you know, declared because people are being led to believe that so much of what's happening now is unprecedented. But you understand that that the warming, the modern warming, which is the end of the Little Ice Age, goes back to the mid-19th century, early to mid-19th century. So the glaciers began to shrink. Now, these glaciers that have, have doubled and tripled in size since the early Holocene have are now receding. They're melting back. So they're forming proglacial lakes. In other words, gla lakes in front of the glaciers. Now, if you have a trunk valley, let's say you got a trunk valley with tributaries coming in, and the tributaries are smaller than the trunk, right? Now, the warming starts, the tributary valleys will melt, and they will form lakes that are ponded against the primary valley glacier, right? Well, now the valley glacier is shrinking as it's receding. It's contributing water to the ponding. So what's happening is the ratio of water mass to ice mass is shifting. And at some point, the water becomes capable of overcoming the obstacle of the ice. Because particularly during a melting phase like that, you have subglacial meltwater. You have glacial surges. Because once you get the subglacial meltwater, that lubricates the base of the glacier and you get glacier surges. When you get a glacier surge, what happens is you're now getting this extensional force applied to the to the ice mass. So this opens up uh, fissures and fractures within the ice. Um, that's a result of tensional forces that are accumulating in the ice because it's surging, right? Moving fast. So what happens then is that over the last 100, 150 years, there have been dozens and dozens of these outburst floods that have been documented. So circling back to the geologists who are now accepting the Brett's floods, they're going, okay, ah, we have a modern analog. We can see this. So what we're seeing here is just a bigger version of what we've witnessed within the last 100 years with outburst floods, glacially dammed outburst floods. Here's the problem, though, Matt, is that even the largest of the modern outburst floods weren't even a thousandth 
the magnitude or volume of these ancient floods. In fact, in fact, some of the the ancient floods, their peak discharges were a thousand to ten thousand times greater than what we see with the modern examples. Now that's been it's it's been acknowledged, but assumed that it was just a totally valid strategy to extrapolate upwards. See, and I maintain that no, it's not. You can't just say, "Well, we've watched modern outburst floods that." Um, you know, might might have half a cubic kilometer of water, right? But we're looking at, at one of the Brett's floods and we're looking at, you know, double, I mean, we're looking at a thousand times to 2,000 times more water than the biggest outburst floods we've seen today. 